guys, I'm Siobhan, an internal medicine and rheumatology specialist. And I'm Mark, I'm a hospitalist, and today we're in Sault Ste. Marie and we're helping out with the doctor shortage. All right, so I always like to start the day by checking our hospital email to find out if we've got any new patients that got admitted from the emergency department overnight, so. Okay, looks like I just got one new patient last night, patient with hypertensive emergency. What about you? How, how's your list looking? Well, it's not too bad, 20 patients. Three news today, one ICU transfer, one pneumonia, and a pretty standard heart failure. He's busier than me. <laughs> <laughs> Typical day on the job. All right, I am going to head to the eMERGE and see this new patient. I'll see you later. See you later. Bye. So I usually start my day by heading to the emergency department because new patients usually haven't made it upstairs yet and they tend to be sicker patients who are coming in and they need more attention early on in the day. Walking into the room, I see a middle-aged woman sitting on the bed, looking at her phone. She tells me that she's had on and off headaches for the past few weeks, but yesterday she developed some blurry vision, so she came to hospital. At triage, her systolic blood pressure was 210, which is extremely high, and the emergency doctors treated her with IV labetalol. I recheck her blood pressure now, and it's still very high. So the key is getting her blood pressure under control, and then figuring out why this is happening. There are actually a surprising number of causes of hypertension, and it's something that I really enjoy working up, so this is how I think about it. Most people have primary hypertension, which means it's not caused by an underlying medical condition. But before we can say that, we have to think about the potential underlying causes that we can treat, like renovascular disease, where the arteries going to the kidneys are narrowed, chronic kidney disease, medications that cause high blood pressure, and various hormone abnormalities, including low thyroid hormone, high adrenaline, high cortisol, and high aldosterone levels. And last but not least, sleep apnea. Now, not everyone with high blood pressure needs to be tested for all these rare causes. But it is important if you're young, if your blood pressure is really hard to control, or if you're having signs of organ damage like this patient who came into the hospital with blurry vision and her blood work shows a mildly elevated troponin level, which suggests her heart is being affected. A lot of these tests are incredibly specialized and they take a while to come back. So we definitely won't have an answer today, but if I have an answer before the video is published, I'll let you know at the end of the video. Okay, let's head upstairs to see the other inpatients. April is the month to be a donor. I'm seeing a patient who initially came in with pneumonia, but while he was here, I noticed that he had ascites, which is extra fluid in the abdomen. There are many reasons why you could develop ascites, but the most common ones that I think about are severe liver disease and cancer. So I've already ordered an ultrasound to take a look at the liver, and in the meantime, I'm just preparing to do a paracentesis. That's the procedure I do at the bedside, where I take fluid off of the patient's belly, and then we send it to do some diagnostic tests. Hopefully we can make a diagnosis later today for this patient. Next step is using the ultrasound to landmark and determine a safe place to do the procedure. As you see here, on the ultrasound, fluid looks black and bowel looks white. The key is finding an area where the bowel is far enough from the abdominal wall to safely insert the needle. And this is how the procedure is done. There is some graphic medical content, so if you don't like needles, skip ahead. First, you clean the skin and set up a sterile field. Then, you freeze the skin before inserting a larger needle to collect the fluid. And depending on how much ascites the patient has, you can then go on to drain liters of fluid out of their abdomen. Alright, the procedure went smoothly. And this is the fluid that we took out of the patient's abdomen. Looks normal to me. Straw colored, relatively clear. We'll have to see what the lab has to say about it. This fluid is considered an irretrievable specimen because you can't easily get another sample. Unlike blood or urine, they are much more simple to collect. For that reason, someone has to actually walk the specimen to the lab to make sure nothing happens to it. So whenever we do a video together, I always see comments saying, I thought Mark was an obstetrician. Yeah, I was actually on my obstetrics rotation in that first video we did together. Mm -hmm. And I liked it so much, I actually considered doing a career in obstetrics. But ultimately, I decided to stick with hospitalist medicine. So that's, that's inpatient medicine and then a little bit of urgent care on the side. Yeah, it's a nice mix. Have you noticed that a whole bunch of people have been commenting on our shoes? No, really? Yeah. Oh my God. So, we apparently have matching shoes. I did not even realize this when we bought them. They just happened to be at this pop-up shop. What are your thoughts, guys? Is it cute to have matching shoes or is it too much? <laughs> so this patient just asked me for a prescription for a free national park pass. 
I love how motivated she is. I'd heard about this, that Canadian doctors were able to give out these free passes or prescribe them uh, for things like um, anxiety or depression, weight loss, hypertension. Um, but I've never actually done it, so I think this is the perfect opportunity. So I went online, I registered, and apparently they'll actually send you a personalized prescription uh, for these park passes. So my fingers are crossed that they send it to me before this patient gets discharged because I'm really excited to do it. And you definitely don't need to convince me how important it is and what a big impact it can have to be out in nature, to be active. Finishing residency, Mark and I did a 700 kilometer hike through Switzerland and Italy. We love hiking and I actually made a video talking about the pretty profound impact that it had on me. So if you want to take a look, I'll, I'll leave a link. But I just love that this program exists and I definitely want to support as many patients as possible. Oh, and let me know if any of you guys have actually prescribed these passes yourself or if you've used them as a patient. I'm really interested to hear. Okay, we got the results back from our paracentesis. And looking at the fluid analysis, it's consistent with portal hypertension. So in portal hypertension, the liver gets scarred down and it blocks off the blood flow from the portal vein, which is a big vein which carries all the blood from your bowels. Basically, when this vein gets overpressured, then fluid leaks out through the walls and into the abdominal cavity. Basically, your bowels are just in this bath of fluid. So the next step is figuring out what caused the damage to his liver. And there are so many causes we need to consider. So I'm going to start the process by sending off a whole panel of blood tests. And in the meantime, I'm going to start him on two diuretic medications. These are water pills that help flush fluid out through the kidneys, and that's going to help prevent fluid from building up in the abdomen again. And guys, I saw the comments. People were asking, what is this thing? This is actually a dictation device. So I can actually sit down and talk into this device and even complex medical words and it's able to type it out for me on the screen. I'm so much faster in my documentation. So I wanted to give you an update about the patient with the hypertensive emergency. So she went home a few days ago. She actually required a couple of different medications to keep her blood pressure under control, but she felt good when she was leaving. We checked her kidney function, thyroid function, monitored her electrolytes, looked at the renal arteries, and everything looks normal so far. The only thing I found is that at night, sometimes her oxygen levels would drop a little bit and her nurses did tell me that she was snoring. So I wonder if this is all related to sleep apnea. When a person stops breathing and starts breathing many, many times throughout the night, it's a known cause of hypertension. So the plan is for her to get an outpatient sleep study to look for sleep apnea and her family doctor is going to follow up with those rare hormone studies that are still pending and haven't come back yet. All right, that's it. So if you guys like this type of content, then be sure to subscribe. And that way, we'll see you in the next video. So, bye, bye for, for now. now.